Welcome to Reef Breakwater Considerations for Living Shorelines in Florida. The objective of this video is to cover information relevant to installing breakwaters made of oyster shells and other materials in a living shoreline. Techniques we will cover in this video include materials, the size, length, width, and height of the breakwater, the shape or orientation of the breakwater, the distance from the mean high water line, as well as grade and breakwater spacing. Let's start with an overview of some of the most common materials. Please notice that inclusion of a particular material in this video does not constitute an endorsement by UF or guarantee of effectiveness or particular suitability for your site. The following is an overview of the most common methods at the time of video production. Keep in mind that new materials are coming out all the time. First, let's talk about shell bags. These are one of the oldest and most common breakwater methods. Shell bags are often constructed by volunteers filling heavy-duty mesh bags with oyster shell. Often, shell is purchased from a mine where fossilized shell deposits are readily available. But there are also many oyster shell recycling programs that offer shell to living shoreline projects for free or reduced costs. While shell bags are convenient, relatively cheap, and have proved successful in many contexts, they do introduce plastic into the water, and this may make them harder to permit in some cases, or unsuitable for certain clients. Luckily, there are lots of alternatives on the market. One such non-plastic material is reef balls, made by Reef Innovations in Sarasota, Florida, or by one of the many nonprofits who have the reef ball forms. There are many sizes of reef ball available, ranging from the one foot high oyster ball to the five foot tall goliath ball, depending on the water depth and intended application. Their modular style means that they can be deployed in many different configurations to create reef breakwaters and enhance oyster habitat. Moving on to another material called the wave attenuation device or WAD, produced by Living Shoreline Solutions in Ruskin, Florida. WADs are often used in higher energy environments and tend to be fairly large scale. They are more angular in shape in comparison to the dome-like reef balls. Another example applied in many smaller scale applications is the oyster castle block produced by Allied Concrete in Charlottesville, Virginia. These are interlocking cinder block-like units that can be stacked in various configurations to create reef breakwaters. Each unit is one foot square at the base and eight inches high. Another option is gabion cages. These are modules usually made of wire mesh that can be filled with rock or shell. Gabion cages can be bought prefabricated from various suppliers or can be constructed and filled on site. Gabions can be made in many sizes and are especially common in brackish freshwater and terrestrial applications such as terracing, where corrosion and rusting of the wire mesh is less of a concern. A very simple and very widely applied material option for breakwater construction is limestone rock. The diameter of the rocks must be chosen carefully based on the energy conditions at the site, but given the wide availability of limestone in Florida, it is a popular local option. Recently, some newer options that incorporate different combinations of cement, natural fibers, and oyster shells have come onto the market. Some examples of these newer materials include the oyster catcher modules from the Sandbar Oyster Company in North Carolina, reef prisms developed at the University of Florida in Gainesville, and core modules developed at the University of Florida Whitney Lab in St. Augustine. All three of these materials have the benefit of being free of plastic, relatively low cost and low weight, and modular in their deployment configurations. There are a few other materials that are less commonly used in Florida, such as recycled concrete, dead trees, wooden branches, and even derelict crab traps. Whatever materials you select for a breakwater, just make sure that you never plan to use anything that could be considered trash, such as old tires, as these materials are harmful to the environment and would not be approved in the permitting process anyway. Now, let's cover some basic details about the size and shape of breakwaters. 
The difference between a project being considered a breakwater versus a sill or edging project has to do with the height, but also the placement of the material. Breakwaters are generally taller and placed offshore of the vegetation elements, while sills tend to be lower profile and placed right at the edge of the vegetation. Decisions about the length and height will impact permitting options. If the breakwater will be more than 500 linear feet long, or if it will be above the water at mean high tide, this will trigger more restrictive permitting, but this may be necessary for large properties or higher energy sites. While taller is not necessarily always better in terms of habitat enhancement, taller breakwaters will provide more protection against waves and wind energy during higher water. Research shows that a breakwater must be at least 60% of the total water depth to be able to influence the incoming energy. The overall length of a breakwater along the shoreline will also determine the number of gaps required to allow wildlife passage. The minimum standard for permitting in Florida is to allow at least one five foot wide gap at least every 75 feet of breakwater. However, gaps may need to be more frequent depending on the conditions at the site. Breakwaters can take many shapes, including linear, curved, alternating curved, T-shaped, angled, haphazard piles, such as when using rocks, or a combination of these. Whatever the shape, the breakwater should be designed and placed to intercept the prevailing incoming wind and wave energy at the site. It is also a bonus if the breakwaters mimic the shapes of nearby natural features such as oyster reefs or sandbars. Now let's talk a little bit about how far off of shore a breakwater will be placed. Another way of thinking about this is the distance of the breakwater away from the mean high water line. We discussed how to find the mean high water line in the considerations for plantings video that is a companion to this video. The decision about how far off of shore to place the breakwater will impact the type of permit the project may need. If breakwater elements will be placed more than 10 feet waterward of the mean high water line, then the state of Florida living shoreline exemption will not apply and a regular permit must be obtained. Keep in mind that in many cases, it may be important or preferable to build a larger project than the small scale state living shoreline exemption allows. For the nationwide 54 permit, which is the expedited federal permit for living shorelines, breakwater elements must be within 30 feet of the mean low water line. This regulatory standard is much less restrictive than the state of Florida rules. But additional rules may apply if you are nearby navigational channels, seagrass beds, or within critical habitat for endangered species. Also keep in mind that there may be important city or county regulations that you need to consider in your permitting process. Finally, I want to cover some information about where you can reasonably expect oysters to grow. If the goal is for oysters to grow on the substrate you install, it is important for the reef elements to end up in a water depth that is suitable to oysters. While this depth may vary regionally, a good rule of thumb is that oysters generally survive when they are exposed to the air between 10 and 55% of the time, with the optimal range being 20 to 40% air exposure time. In many areas of the Florida West Coast, the survival zone for oysters translates to intertidal depths between negative two feet in AVD and mean sea level. However, this can vary widely by site depending on how much tidal fluctuation is present in the system. A good way to find target elevations for placing oyster reef elements is to measure the elevations of the top and bottom of live oyster clumps that can be found on nearby structure such as dock pilings and use these measurements to target placement grades for oyster breakwaters. We hope this video was helpful to you. Please feel free to leave a comment in the comments section and don't forget to check out the companion video about installing vegetation for living shorelines in Florida.